24, take one, common sticks. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the loudness of that. He's fine. The editor will replace the start. Um, first, more than anything, Bob, I want to say what a tremendous honor it is. And thank you for your service uh, to this country and to all of us. Well, I appreciate those sentiments. Thank you. I, Thank you. Um, so, as I, as I said, what makes, I know you've been interviewed many, many times, and, and a lot of fuss has been made over you and your story and everything else. What makes this project unique is that we're here to learn from you and your fellow former POWs. Um, So the purpose of the Return with Honor project is to get to the root of that for leadership training, to help uh, other future military leaders of tomorrow to understand what you found and the, the, the sort of nut kernel of it. And um, I know this is uh, can be a, um, a challenging uh, time as well to revisit some of these memories, and please guide me. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. you bet. Sounds like a worthwhile project to me. It is. It really is extraordinary, honestly. All right, I'm going to just make a slight adjustment on that. There we go. Sure. Um, so, the first thing I'd like to do is in, with each of the interviewees is just get, have you give a brief chronology of how it was that you arrived in the Hanoi prison system and what. I know that you were uh, a um, resident of Alcatraz along with the other uh, uh, 10 of your, of your um, cellmates, and that was an extraordinarily difficult time to be the target. Um, so just give us a brief chronology so I have cutaway points about your storyline. Well, we're talking about an incident of over 50 years ago. Uh, I'm. My name is Robert Shoemaker. Most people call me Bob or Shoe. And I, at that uh, time in 1965, February, um, I was a newly married uh, uh, naval officer uh, uh, flying an airplane called an F-8 Crusader, which was a fighter, single engine fighter that could go a thousand miles an hour. And uh, I was, uh, uh, my squadron was aboard the USS Coral Sea. And uh, th there had been some disturbances in, in uh, Vietnam. I think the readers are familiar with some of the history of that. The country was divided between the North and the South, and the United States was supporting the South. The North was uh, essentially a communist-run uh, country. And so uh, there was an attack by the uh, North against uh, a hotel in the South. And in retaliation for that, uh, my squadron and, and other uh, attack uh, groups were ordered to attack uh, some uh, military barracks north of the demilitarized zone. And it was a t near a town called Doing, Dong Hoi. And uh, it was a bad weather day. We were flying lower than we normally would. And uh, I got hit uh, in the tail section by anti-aircraft fire. And sometimes airplanes don't fly very well with bullet holes in them. And, and that was true in this case. The airplane flipped upside down and pointed nose down. And I was a, about to uh, click the button on my throttle, my microphone button, and I was going to say 403, I'm hit. But had I finished that rather short sentence, uh, I, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So I, I got out 403 and then ejected. 
and it was at a pretty low altitude, and uh, uh, the parachute opened to what I later calculated to be about 35 feet above the ground. And, and in our training, we're, we're taught to distribute the, the shock of landing. Uh, it's called a seven-point roll, where you land on your feet and roll sideways on your knees and take some of the shock on your hips. Anyway, I perfected the one-point landing right on my bottom, and consequently, I'm about an inch shorter than I used to be. Uh, and this, uh, it broke my back when I, when I landed. Um, so then I uh, concealed myself in the bushes for a while, hoping that I, I'd, uh, that I'd find a rescue helicopter. Um, I, I was busy burying uh, th incriminating things, like yeah, I had a 38 pistol with, uh, with tracer ammunition, uh, mostly for rescue purposes. And uh, that's against uh, uh, the Geneva Convention, so I was burying all that ammunition, burying my uh, security cards and things. And now, I'll interrupt here. How much longer is, am I getting too lengthy in my talk? No, sir, you're doing great. Thank you. Uh, so anyway, I, uh, I was, thought I was pretty well concealed, and then um, I heard, after the air raid was over, I heard Vietnamese voices uh, and there was a, uh, quite a, a long string of uh, Vietnamese. Uh, some were uh, military militia, most of them were civilians, and they were kind of ragtag, you know, they, a lot of them were in bare feet and things, and they were shouting Anglais, Anglais, which is French for Englishman. There, there was a very strong French influence there and had been for the preceding 100 years. And so uh, they all passed me by and I figured I'm home free here. Yeah, but there's always one guy goofing off in a military platoon, uh, platoon and one guy turned around and he happened to catch uh, my little narrow uh, uh, field of view and he had his AK-47 on me and that was the end of uh, uh, my uh, freedom for the next uh, eight years. Um, they, they marched me off to a, a large auditorium uh, where there must have been oh, maybe four or five hundred people and I remember uh, uh, in English, uh, one uh, man said, uh, uh, you know, why are you bombing churches? And, and uh, I said, it, it turned out he was a Russian. And I said, uh, you know, I wasn't bombing churches and it's none of your business. And then they, they hauled me off to, uh, to a sand dune and uh, where there were four riflemen and, uh, and, and one uh, Vietnamese officer. And my thought went back to a movie called Captain's Paradise where uh, uh, the captain was being, uh, and it was in front of a firing squad, and that was the scene here. But I was hurting so badly with my broken back that, that I thought, well, this is just kind of like going to the dentist, you know. It'll hurt for a little while, but it'll all be over. Well, hopefully now uh, they, they, they didn't uh, shoot, uh, and eventually it got me in a, I was handcuffed, put me in a uh, Jeep-like vehicle and transported over the next, I think it was maybe at least two days, uh, on the road, on the bumpiest road you could possibly imagine, on the way 200 miles north to the, to the capital city of Hanoi. And I was put into a prison that the French had built. It was right in the middle of, uh, of the city. And uh, it, it, was, it was the regular prison for common criminals. And it was called uh, the fiery furnace, or in Vietnamese, the Hua Lo prison, and we later uh, renamed it. But uh, uh, then started a series of interrogations, and uh, we, we military uh, people are are, uh, are sworn to abide by a, uh, a code called the Big Four, and the Big Four means you're, you're obliged to give only your name, rank, serial number, and date of birth, and these are. Uh, th th this code was developed through the Geneva Conventions on the Treatment of Prisoners wo of War, w which basically said that uh, captive uh, POWs were not to be, were be, to be treated fairly and, and not uh, uh, inhumanely and not tortured. But uh, Vietnam uh, uh, decided, that is North Vietnam, decided uh, not to abide by those rules, and as was uh, to be experienced in the next eight years, they did indeed resort to, to torture. The, um, you were noted for your fierce resistance to um, the Viet Vietnamese and their, what, what do you, in your 
your estimation, what was it they were purposely, after a certain point in time, the intel you could give them was limited or non-existent, but they continued to press you. What was their purpose, and, and what were they trying to break you to? Well, I don't think they were, at that time, in 65, were smart enough to ask good military questions, and as a matter of fact, uh, we made it a policy on the aircraft carrier not to know future targets, you know, so in case we were captured, we couldn't reveal them. But uh, the, the Vietnamese uh, tried to ask some uh, military questions, but it was obvious that th that was secondary to their purpose. Their, their real purpose was to uh, use these POWs as political pawns and get them to, as they would put it, cross over to the people's side. And so the initial interrogations, which would last uh, uh, hours at a time, and it would be in a room where, where uh, I, I would sit on a concrete block, and it was very important in their culture to be elevated from where I was sitting. So they would be on, on a platform, they being three uh, uh, interrogators, military officers, and I suppose they were probably of the rank of major or something like that. Um, but you know, they, they kept asking uh, uh, questions, uh, and most of the questions were were about uh, my background and personal questions. And I, I, I sensed that they were, uh, th that if I told them a lot of stuff about me personally, they would uh, use that as blackmail against my family. Uh, and I, I wasn't about to, t to tell them anything. And this went on for, for days and days. Uh, they were asking one question. They wanted to know how many chickens my father owned. And my father uh, w was a Harvard Law graduate and a f fairly successful lawyer. Um, and uh, one, one th I didn't want to answer the question, and I didn't for a long time, uh, but I figured after a couple of days, what the heck, it wouldn't make any difference if I told him that he owned 35 chickens, which was a complete fabrication. Uh, well, well, that was a real mistake, and I realized this when I got back to my cell, that I had crossed the red line, and so that, you know they would keep pushing for more and more, so I resolved that if they wanted anything more out of me, uh, th they'd have to uh, uh, force me uh, to, uh, to give it to them, a and, and they did. And, and it was kind of hard because uh, even though we were obliged to follow the big four, in front of them, of these interrogators, they had copies of Time Magazine and, and the New York Times and all kinds of information. And I, I had been an astronaut candidate, and so they seized on that. They thought that was pretty neat. And, and I guess my parents had given an interview. They had all that stuff before them. And here I was sticking to the, to the big four when they had all this information, which seemed kind of incongruous. But, but, but nonetheless, I decided I'd clam up and not give them anything uh, further. So th these sessions would last for oh, maybe three hours at a time. And, and then uh, th that'd be in the morning, and, and then in the afternoon it would re repeat itself. This went on for a couple of weeks because there was only one other uh, American prisoner there at the time. He was a, a marvelous guy, a, a, a dear friend of mine now, is, and then his name was uh, Everett Alvarez, and he preceded me by about six uh, months. Uh, and, uh, I, I, and, and an important part of the, our captivity that was true throughout these eight years, or at least six of the eight years, was that the Vietnamese tried to separate prisoner A from prisoner B so that they could not communicate and they went to great lengths to achieve this. They, they would have twice as many guards as they had prisoners just to enforce this uh, principle. And the, the, I think the uh, psychology here was that if we couldn't talk to each other and we, if we couldn't refute what the Vietnamese were trying to tell us was the real news, then we would uh, uh, be more amenable to their, uh, uh, their story. And, uh, so it was really important that we, we develop some way to communicate, and, and that's what we did eventually, and, and it, it was really our lifeblood uh, throughout this imprisonment that we were, were able to uh, overcome their attempts to brainwash us. Um, in in the, each cell, there was a loudspeaker embedded in the ceiling, and the loudspeaker would have uh, uh, Hanoi Hannah, what was what we called her, uh, and, and others, they would present their side of the news. And I remember that one day they, after a quiz or during a quiz, they told me, uh, Schumacher, they, they could never pronounce my name right. 
uh, we, we shot down 35 airplanes today. And, and so I'd go back to my cell, or they put me back in my cell, and I'd think, wow, what, they can really tell whoppers, you know. And I'd sit there by myself, you know, didn't have a newspaper, didn't have any other thing. And, and then your mind plays tricks on you, and you think, well, uh, is it possible they could have shot down 35? And, and then after a while, you start thinking, I wonder if there's anybody I know, you know, that they shot down. And, and, and so this solitary confinement kind of leads you into, uh, into almost believing what they're trying to tell you. And of course, they were real fabrications. Uh, but uh, in the first three months, I was in solitary confinement. And, and eventually, I served almost three years in solitary confinement. But the first three months, um, all this back and forth stuff went on until one day, peeking through a little wormhole in my wooden cell door, uh, through which I had a limited view of the courtyard, I, I saw another American. And uh, th th once a day or, or so, the, uh, the guards would come, open the door, and you take your sanitation bucket, which was kind of a, about a three gallon bucket, uh, and you you take it oh, maybe 50 yards away to, a, to what was once a, a shower area, but no longer uh, functioned that way. And you dump your sanitation bucket and then come back to your cell. Well, uh, after a couple of days of observation, I noticed they would always take me first and then take this other guy later. So I decided to um, try to cheer this guy up. So we, we did have uh, kind of toilet paper, but nothing you would imagine to be toilet paper. It was more like sandpaper, I suppose. And uh, someone had spilled some ink on the floor of my cell probably years before. And so I kept pouring water on this spot until I, I got it to, to look kind of like ink. And so on this toilet paper, I wrote him a note. And the, the note simply said, welcome to the Hanoi Hilton. If you get this note on, on the way back, scratch your ear. and. Uh, I, I've cleaned up the story a little bit for, for the audience here, but anyway, I was peeking out in this little wormhole, and sure enough, he was scratching away, and that, that was the first contact I'd, I'd had uh, with another American in, uh, in three months at that time. And, and that's how the place got named. For, uh, for some reason, people just seized on that name, and you know, I think it was even made into a movie, the, the Hanoi Hilton. And, and coincidentally, uh, I have a nephew who served in the U.S. Congress, <clears throat> Uh, before he became a congressman, he, he made a trip over to, to Vietnam as part of, the, uh, uh, he was uh, going through a uh, business school called Kellogg School of Business, and, and, and they required the students to do a research project on a business. So this Hanoi Hilton prison uh, was later after the war turned into a, a, a real uh, Hilton hotel. And... Uh, my, my nephew said, uh, hey, so it's a pretty nice hotel, but they aren't making any money, so and that pleased me. But uh, so, so that's how it happened, if you want to pause here. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, do, you, do you need a little break? Or no, no. <clears throat> my understanding is you have, uh, you had a background, a, 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 a scholastic background in cryptology, right? Uh, I don't think I want to get into okay, that. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, I, I actually just want Okay, good. Uh, can you tell the story of how you first came into awareness of the concept? Yeah, what happened was uh, when I was in this cell in 1965, uh, there were apparently a lot of common criminals that were using up a lot of other cells, and the Vietnamese had to make room for uh, subsequent POWs, so they, they somehow they moved these uh, civilian prisoners out, uh, but, but before they were able to accomplish that, th they, they moved three POWs in with me in, in this uh, room. I call it a cell, but it was really uh, more of a room at this time. And uh, one guy's name was uh, Phil Butler, and one was Smitty Harris, and, and another was Bob Peel. And we were so happy that we, we, we talked for days until our jaw muscles wouldn't let us talk anymore. But uh, I was the senior guy there. I was the lieutenant commander, which is like a, a major in the Air Force. And, and I said, hey, you know, they're going to try to separate us later on, so we ought to figure some way to stay in contact. So one guy said, well, why don't we try writing on the backs of, the, of our uh, lunch pails? And what they served us 
when were little uh, metal containers that were enameled and uh, contained uh, food, a couple of uh, bowls. And, and so we tried that, and we tried to contact Alvarez that way, and it just didn't work out. So anyway, I said, we gotta think of something else. So this guy, Smitty Harris, said, well, you know, during a survival school that I attended, that was, uh, that was taught by a, a, a former POW from Korea, you know, 15 years previous, uh, the, uh, he, uh, during a coffee break, this sergeant was uh, surrounded by some of the students, and it was not part of the curriculum, but it was just during coffee break conversation. And my friend, Smitty, happened to be on the periphery of this uh, group. And the, someone asked the sergeant, well, how did you communicate in Korea? And he said, well, we had these buildings that were connected by water pipes, and we would tap on the, on the pipes, and they would hear us in, in adjoining or in, uh, in nearby uh, buildings. And they said, well, what do you mean you tapped? And he said, well, we uh, developed this code, and apparently it had been a, a code that had existed in the past, it, it, and it was called the AFLQV code. And it got its name because uh, it, in a five by five square that had five rows and five columns, um, you can put uh, the alphabet if you leave off the letter K. And so the first column, well, first, the first row would read, of course, A, B, C, D, and E, but the first column would read A, F, L, Q, V, and that's uh, how we call it, uh, that's the name of, the, of our uh, tap code. And so t to send a, a message, you would, uh, you would first say, well, I'll have to make sure that it was an American on the other side of the wall. And the way you'd, you would do that would be that, you know, most of us in, back in 1965 uh, uh, knew a, a kind of a ring-up code called shave and a haircut, and then the answer was two bits. And uh, so we would shave and a haircut w with our taps, and if it were an American on the other side, you come back with two bits and you knew you were safe to start transmitting. And the way you would transmit would be, you would send, uh, first of all, uh, the number of the row that the letter was, let's say you were gonna send the letter S. It's in the fourth row. Uh, and, and, and the uh, third column. So you would send four taps, pause, and then three taps, and that would be the letter S. And you'd think, my golly, it's gonna take you forever to send a message, and it did. But after a while, you get pretty quick, uh, fast at it, and, and I clocked us uh, when we got expert at it at about five or six words per minute. And, and sometimes the guy on the other side, if he knew after the first couple letters of a word, what that word was gonna be, he would give you two taps, a a acknowledging that, okay, I know what word you're sending, and then you move on to the next word. So it, uh, and uh, of course, while you were you know, listening on the wall, you didn't wanna caught, get caught doing this. In, in fact, later on, I had a roommate named Norm Schmidt, Air Force major, and uh, he got caught uh, communicating, and they beat him to death. So they, they were pretty serious about it about this not communicating stuff. But to avoid getting caught, we would put our ear up against the wall and, and our eyes would be watching shadows uh, underneath the, uh, the door of the cell. So that if, if we saw a shadow, which probably meant a guard was about to spring to the door and open the hatch and, and catch you communicating, you could get off the wall quickly. And then to keep the noise down real low, we, we had uh, 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 cups, they were metal, enameled cups, and you'd put that up against the wall and your ear against that, and that would uh, amplify the noise coming from the other side, and it was really uh, pretty soft. But anyway, the Vietnamese got pretty uh, uh, savvy about this whole thing. There wasn't much they could do about it, but they would come in and they would check our knuckles, because we would get calluses on our knuckles by tapping on the, on the wall. Right. Remember right. this conversation with a sergeant at lunch, and that became the beginning of something. And we'll 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 go into it further, but the TAP code became more than just a communication network. It became a 
Yeah, it really did, you know, because it's, it's just very tough t to be in solitary confinement, you know, and and your your mind wanders in various directions, and it's nice to get a kind of a stabilizing couple of taps from the other side of the wall. Um, and I would, you'd ask, well, what did you uh, communicate? And, uh, you know, when you look back on it, it probably wasn't that significant, but, but it kept our spirits buoyed, and, and we communicated uh, uh, lessons in, and how to speak French, and then how to change the oil in your car, and how to fix television sets. And, and this tap code, aside from tapping through brick walls, uh, has some uh, permutations to it in that uh, we, we, one of our Alcatraz 11 guys was a guy named Jerry Denton, and he came up with a, what he called the cough code, uh, which was kind of built off the tap code. So instead of uh, tapping, you would have you would cough once to be row number one, cough twice to be row number two. You you you'd uh, hack like like that or something, and and this would go on until I'm sure the Vietnamese thought we were they were running a tuberculosis ward or something, you know. But anyway, we were able to communicate that way too. And 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 there were further further developments. I actually read. Well, certainly one of them, one of them was uh, GNGB, you know, good night, God bless. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and additionally then, as the uh, Vietnamese clamped down on the audio part of the tap code, um, talk a little bit about the other ways that, for instance, I know that when someone was set out on the duty of, of sweeping or raking leaves or anything like that, that you could use that visually. So well, like I say, it did have a lot of permutations to it, and, and, and um, I may be jumping ahead of the story, but at one time I was in solitary confinement with 10 others in a group called Alcatraz 11, and uh, uh, Admiral Denton again, he, he was a commander at the time, uh, was convinced that he could understand what the Vietnamese were, uh, uh, were up to by, by kind of talking to the guards and uh, the, the guards didn't, didn't speak English. And, and by, by the way, th they purposely uh, uh, would not let us learn Vietnamese because they thought that we might le learn some intelligence from them or so. But anyway, at one time in 1967, I think it was, uh, Denton was convinced that we were uh, gonna be released uh, the next day. And, and his basis for this was that uh, a guard had come to him and, and, and offered him a grasshopper to eat and uh, and then shrugged his shoulders and the gra and the, the guard uh, shrugged his and just popped it in his mouth and crunched away and, and then uh, shortly thereafter they, they told us to roll up our bamboo mats because we were we were going to move out uh, b because there was a flood coming and you know they were always worried that the Americans would bomb their dikes and the, that would flood things so anyway uh, Jerry was really convinced we were going home so uh, against all caution, uh, he was down at the end of the line there. I could hear him banging on the wall. You know, I mentioned before we were very soft on the tapping and he was making us believe as if he were the commanding officer of an aircraft carrier and getting underway and I'd hear boom, boom, boom. You know, you'd almost ring your, uh, your ear saying, uh, take up on the port anchor. And, and then you come back with port anchor in sight, you know. And well, the next morning, you know, we. Uh, we weren't released, you know, and so we were still there. And so I had the enviable duty of, of sweeping the courtyard. And uh, the Vietnamese hadn't figured out how to put broomsticks on the end of a broom. So they, they, they bend on over with a real short broom. And so I, I would sweep along, sending a code as I sweep, you know. And I, I sent the important stuff. And then I still had to sweep from here to there. And uh, for lack of something to say, I, I said, uh, uh, sir, the anchor must have gotten stuck on the Brooklyn. Oh, uh, 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 Denton had said, uh, uh, "I don't buy that, and I don't. Uh, 
I, uh, I don't buy the Brooklyn Bridge either. So anyway, in my retort back, I said, sir, the uh, anchor must have gotten stuck on the Brooklyn Bridge. He didn't like that. He was going to court-martial me out of this whole thing. But anyway, uh, we became friends later. So, but what they did understand was that if they could break the American spirit, break the spirit of you men, that they then had a pliable um, uh, uh, resource for their propaganda and things like that. So breaking your spirits was far more important than any intelligence they felt they could get in a very good way. Each of you um, went through the same experience, the experience of failure. This is a huge thing when this moment of redemption that you rebuilt your sense of self together. Can you talk me through from a military perspective, sir? Because there are many people in the military and having left the military who on one level or another are dealing with uh, feelings like they may not have performed as well as they wanted or want. Talk to me about failure and about your experience of what you went through and where You know, this has application not just to military people, but people in general that, you know, life has its ups and downs and, and uh, they're not all ups. Um, and and uh, the, the, like the Vietnamese, for the first uh, oh, six months or so, did not resort to torture, but they kept trying to get information out of uh, POWs. And, and eventually they, they did resort to torture. I was tortured on 12 different occasions. And on the first one, uh, the, the technique they used w was uh, to handcuff you, uh, but th they have uh, handcuffs that are, are ratcheted handcuffs, and they would apply them kind of halfway up your arm, and your arms were behind your back, and your wrists were, were bound together. And that cut off all circulation, and it eventually became very, very painful. And uh, then I was blindfolded, and they put me in the, and I was surrounded by a bunch of guards that were kind of playing basketball with me. They'd throw me from one guard to another back and forth. Then they stuck me in the, in the cell, and the pain was really intense. And, and so I decided, you know, I, I didn't want to give them anything. They were asking for a confession. And so I started banging my head against the, the wall, trying to commit suicide. Well, they, they broke into the cell and, and prevented me from doing that. And I eventually had to, had to give them uh, some written statement. 
but it, it was it, no one could even read it because my hands weren't uh, my arms weren't functioning and even to this day uh, my thumbs uh, are lacking some uh, some feeling because of that experience and, and other torture sessions that, that went on but I, I remember going back to my cell and and just crying and crying about uh, you know I'd let my country down my family down and uh, even now it's a little hard talking about it uh, but but uh, um, the thing that saved us, though, was this ability to communicate and find out that your situation was not unique and that uh, you would, you would uh, succumb to all this pain. But, uh, you know, the secret was to get back up off the mat like a good boxer would do and get ready for the, for the next round. And there would be other rounds to follow, you know. But, but anyway, if only for your own pride, you, you have to do what you know is right and and realize that uh, sometimes you're you're forced in the opposite direction uh, but but it's, it's not uh, catastrophic sir I, I, i'm so moved by what you're sharing i, I just uh, i can't i don't have words um charlie palm i believe told me a story when you were filming with him about um, the role you played in when he broke up Well, I remember some parts of it because Charlie uh, uh, gives a lot of motivational speeches and he talks about this incident. But, but, but we were in a place that we named uh, the Desert Inn. All these facilities, the subdivisions of the Hanoi Hilton had uh, gambling names like the Thunderbird and the, the Mint. But we were in the Desert Inn and uh, the, the French had designed this, this prison and the cells were about eight feet by eight feet in, in size and they had four bunks in there, uh, 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 two of them at a normal level and then uh, two above. And each of these uh, bunks had uh, stockades at the bottom that they could operate from outside the cell. So if they wanted to really punish you, they'd, they'd stick your, uh, your ankles in these uh, stockades, close the clamp, and lock it from the outside. Um, so, uh, see, I lost my train of thought here. Charlie. Uh, oh, Charlie, I'm, I'm with you now. Okay. Uh, so, anyway, the, these cells it had a little rat hole in them. Uh, the rat hole was, was a hole about six inches by six inches. And I think the original intent was that they could uh, uh, throw water in this thing and it would drain out this hole, you know, for cleaning purposes. But anyway, these two, the, the cells were separated by hallways that were probably about oh, five feet. And in, in the hallway that separated my cell from Charlie's, uh, they decided to keep a lot of storage material, and we, which was fortunate for me because I had found a piece of wire uh, that was uh, about six feet long. It was a flexible piece of wire, and I could roll it up and, and uh, cement it inside uh, a cavity in the wall. And I, I got that thing out when I knew someone was in, in Charlie's cell. And it took me a half an hour to work this uh, wire from my cell through all this junk they had in the hallway and into his cell. And he tells the story somewhat amusingly that he was there, he'd been broken, he had boils, uh, and was just uh, kind of despondent. And he heard the, this uh, uh, cricket chirping. And uh, after a while, he looked down, he, he, he saw it wasn't a cricket, it was this wire that was in his cell that was rubbing against the concrete. and and he. He tells how he was uh, hesitant to even pick up the wire because he thought there'd be some macho American on the other end of that thing that, that, that would chastise him for having uh, given more than the big four. But finally he picked the wire up and, and he felt it tugging and then it disappeared. And then about a half an hour later, the wire comes back into a cell, but this time it had a, a paper uh, note uh, on the end of it. And he took the note off and it, it was this tap code and it, it said, learn this tap code and then eat this note, and which he did. And uh, apparently whatever I said to him uh, was, uh, was beneficial and he seemed to come out of his despondency. I think the way he tells it is that he was finally able to express to you that he had broken. Hmm. And um, you gave some words of encouragement, but in essence you also said, get over it. Yeah, <laughs> We've yeah. got work to do. Suck it up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe tell that in your own words. 
Uh, well, I, yeah, yeah, he was lamenting the fact, uh, you know, that he'd, he, he was weak because he had given, you know, and, and I, I can't remember the exact words, but, but I, I told him, uh, uh, Charlie, you gotta stop feeling sorry for yourself, you know, you gotta realize that other people have had the same problem and just suck it up and get back on your feet and get ready for the next round. And he credits me with, with helping him in that regard. Uh, it was rear admiral. That's yeah, two star, right? Yeah, it's, uh, as rear admiral. So you are someone who is used to leadership and used to command, and you see the power and value of command structure. One of the things that's extraordinary about the story of the of you and your fellow former POWs uh, from Vietnam, um, in most cases of extreme hardship, we talk about. When we talk about you, we look at extraordinary stories of not just survival, because certainly you were surviving, and many times I know you were hanging on for dear life, um, but there is a way in which you thrived as well, because you built something together that all of you, when the, when the battery of psychological testing and physical testing is done, one of the questions asked was, you know, reflect back on your experience, and many, many of you have said, I would never want to go through this again. I would never want to repeat it. I would never want this to happen to someone else, but I'm a better man for what I experienced. Was that, if you could speak to Sir to what ingredients you saw as a, as a military man in, in the Hanoi prison systems that helped these men rise above their circumstances, to bond together, to find ways to fight back, and to encourage each other. And because these are military lessons that we can all learn from. Well, you know, a lot of times the military gets accused of being uh, dogmatic and that the, the top guy tells the next guy to do something and he tells the next guy. But, but really, uh, the military, uh, I think, has changed a lot uh, in that we, we realize that that, that no matter what rank a person has, they, 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 they have the potential uh, to make contributions. And uh, one, one thing that uh, it kind of bothered us uh, over there was initially, uh, we, we had a, a little argument in the first year, and some people had an argument, about whether an Air Force uh, major uh, was a senior to a Navy lieutenant commander or something. I even just really stupid. Well, we uh, uh, we had a good leader over there uh, named uh, Larry Garino, and, and he uh, uh, he said, "Hey, put that stuff aside. You know, we're all working for the same nation, and 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 we all fall in uh, with our data ranks." But um, the, the confusing thing to me initially was that uh, we, we had some very senior people. We had some. Uh, what they call O sixes. These are colonels, and uh, and, uh, and sometimes they, they uh, a few of them, not many, but just a few of them, did not rise to their responsibility as as leaders. And this, this was kind of shocking to me. But as I reflect on it, uh, you realize that uh, no matter what rank you, you you have pinned to your shoulders, you know, you're still a human being, and uh, and you respond to external pressures. Um, and, and in contrast to that, we have some very uh, junior people. Uh, uh, I'm thinking one guy that just underwent a whole lot of torture, you know, and yet he kind of uh, stood up and, and, uh, and, and helped all of us. And, and we had a, one very junior guy who uh, came from South Dakota. He was an E2, which is, uh, about one step up from the bottom in the in military rank, and uh, he was assigned to the aircraft uh, uh, to the uh, cruiser Canberra, which was steaming I at night off the coast of Vietnam, six miles off the shore. He was uh, down in the engine room, and it was a hot summer night, so he decided to come up and get some air. About the time the Vietnamese shore batteries took the ship under fire, the captain had to uh, go to flank speed 
and do uh, zigging and zagging. And unfortunately, this guy, Doug Hagdahl was his name, fell overboard. And the captain of the ship couldn't go back and get him and endanger his ship, so Hagdahl started swimming. And uh, I, I guess there's a lesson in that, too. You know, when you're thrown in the middle of, the, of an ocean, you don't have many options, and you just got to start swimming. And he did, he made it ashore. The Vietnamese caught him. They thought he was a CIA agent. I forgot to tell you, he had lost his uniform on the way over there, so he was in civilian clothes. But th this guy uh, was a marvelous uh, kid. You know, he, he had a uh, photographic memory, and he was able to memorize the names of all the POWs. And as a matter of fact, you know, all of us did that. But he went further, and he remembered their hometowns, he remembered their shoot-down dates, remembered the telephone numbers of the their next of kin. And this was important because if, if we were to escape or somehow uh, get back to the United States with all this information, it was important because the Vietnamese would release only about one out of every three shoot-down uh, names. And consequently, uh, wives were uh, thought their husbands may have died, and they divorced, remarried. And, uh, so Hegdahl had all this information, and he, uh, he was selected to go home early. And maybe we can come back and talk about that program we call the Fink program. But Hegdahl didn't want to go, but he was uh, directed by the senior guy in his camp, you have all this information, so go, go home. So Hegdahl and two... Uh, uh, senior, uh, not senior, but uh, I think they were lieutenants, Navy lieutenants, um, were sent home early. And the two lieutenants go off with their wives on a vacation, collect their back pay, and Hegdahl collects his back pay. Well, you can imagine as an E2, you don't make a whole lot of money, but it was enough to buy a Greyhound bus ticket that took, that took him all the way around the United States, where he stopped at each of these towns that, that he memorized, rang up the telephone numbers that he knew, told those people, met with them, uh, and told them about what he knew about their next of kin. So the next time you see a young kid walking down the street with his uh, uh, hair needing a haircut and his, his uh, pants hanging down, uh, yeah, you know, don't give up on these young people, you know, like Hegdahl, I'm sure there's a Hegdahl in, in a, a guy like that. Well, thank you. Because it's one of the extraordinary stories of, of that time. But you make a really, really interesting and strong point here. And, and it, there's one um, uh, Marine Major said to me re recently, you know, the story of the Hanoi prison system is not just a story of excellent leadership. It's also a story of exemplary followership. Mm -hmm. Like that the junior officers and the way they stepped up and the way that part of the military system of those who follow effectively. Can you say something about that? Well, like I say, the, uh, the, the junior people, uh, you know, really did uh, uh, follow the chain of command, you know. It was real, the, the Vietnamese tried to destroy our chain of command, and at times they would not deal with, uh, say, Admiral Stockdale, but instead went to the, the junior guy and tried to invert our chain of command. And, and yet I think it's so inbred in us as military officers that, uh, that, that uh, you know, that's an important part of our culture. And so we didn't, didn't buy that and we uh, seemed to have survived. Can you say something about um, your experience of the senior leadership in the Hanoi prison system? What, what kinds of things the senior leadership, what kind of initiatives they took, um, how, what things that you felt Well, I was kind of in the middle of the ranks there. Most of these prisoners, and there were 591 of them eventually that returned, uh, most of them were, were pilots, and so they were O2s all the way up to O6s, I suppose. And, and I was in the middle as an O4. Uh, and I think I had some influence on uh, as a leader there. Um, and I think the Vietnamese must have recognized that because in about 1967, they, they thought they knew who the leaders were. Now, they didn't, in my estimation, it didn't get everybody, but they got 11 guys, and they decided to give them special treatment. 
and by special, I mean especially bad treatment. And so we were put in this uh, solitary confinement for almost three years, in, and we called ourselves the Alcatraz 11. Uh, and I, I think our, our, our ticket into, the, into this group was because the Vietnamese thought we were uh, leaders. And so to keep us from escaping, I don't know how we would have gotten out of these little four foot by nine foot concrete cells, but at, at, at night, uh, we were along about five o'clock in the, in the afternoon, <coughs> they would uh, uh, put our ankles in, uh, in sh uh, shackles so that our left ankle was kind of barred to our right ankle so that we, we couldn't, if we did escape, we couldn't get very far. And, and that went on every night for a long, long time. Uh, but um, on, on the subject of, of leadership, you know, like I said earlier, some was good and some was bad, you know, and, and certainly uh, we, we had an Air Force uh, Lieutenant Colonel it was just marvelous as a leader. He was inspired uh, as a religious person. His name was Robbie Reisner. And uh, we had others too, like uh, Air Force uh, um, Major then, uh, Bud Day. And uh, th th these two guys are, are immortalized uh, in, in bronze statues now, one at the Naval Academy and one at the Air Force Academy. Um, so you know, leaders uh, arose, uh, and, and others uh, just kind of lived their life quietly, you know, and not, not stirring things up much. But, but you know, I, I kind of figured out there were about four kinds of people, the, uh, the various permutations of, of, of tough and weak, uh, and uh, the, 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 the first group is a guy that, that was uh, tough to start with and stayed tough all the way through the thing. And another guy was a guy that was uh, tough, but kind of weakened as time went on. Then there were the weak guys that stayed weak all the time. And fortunately, there weren't a whole lot of them. And the, the worst type was, uh, were the weak, weak guys that decided to get strong by kicking a gook in the butt every, every time they, and then I sh you better cut that out. I shouldn't call him a gook. But uh, uh, so there are all kinds of people. And, and, uh, and I think, to be a leader, you have to realize that there are all kinds of people. They respond to different stimuli, and uh, and, and your secret as a leader is to figure out uh, uh, how to stimulate them to the benefit of the group. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, when was the, let's talk about um, honor for a moment. Honor is certainly one of the pillars of naval Well, I do. Uh, the words "return with honor" uh, kind of came out of uh, Jim Stockdale, and uh, he he really was a marvelous leader. And in fact, even today, there's at the Naval Academy uh, a center called the Stockdale Center uh, in his honor. And you know, we we we, we train our military officers, and we have to train them this way to to be technicians in a way, like. You know, I think I was a, a capable fighter pilot, and others are, are trained to operate ships and missiles and things. But but there's there's more to leadership than just uh, uh, the, the technology that keeps changing. And the one thing that is, that is so important and stays the constant is uh, a person's sense of honor. It, incidentally, one of, one of the POWs there. Uh, later became a vice admiral and the superintendent of the Naval Academy, and his, his name was Bill Lawrence. And 
as a midshipman, he was, uh, he was the author of the honor code at the Naval Academy. And uh, so, you know, and, and he set the, uh, an example over there along with some others uh, of being honorable. And if you wanna be a leader, you, you just have to be on firm ground that, that you are ethical and, uh, and, and courageous and, and stick to, um, you know, your, your beliefs as to what, uh, what is ethical and, and, and what is honorable. And uh, you'll, you'll have a firm foundation for leadership. That, and leadership, in my definition, is uh, convincing others to uh, follow the, uh, the course that, that you suggest uh, uh, toward the, uh, the group's uh, overall goal. Did your um, sense of the definition of honor change from the time you were a young pilot to the time you were on that tarmac uh, and coming home after your experience with Vietnam? Well, the question is, did my sense of honor uh, change? And I don't think it did because I, I uh, was fortunate in being born into a family that, that, that was ethical and, and honorable. And I think they uh, uh, imbued that in, into me and my brother and my sister, you know. And, and, and then I think it was further enhanced by going to the Naval Academy where, where uh, honor is, is preached almost uh, uh, every day. And not, not just from a, a negative point of view, that is, you know, we, we realized as midshipmen that, that if we did something dishonorable, the end result was probably expulsion from the Naval Academy. That's just kind of the negative side of honor, but there's a positive side also, you know, that if you do honorable things that, that, that uh, beneficial things are going to happen to you and, and people will, will recognize you as a person of uh, ethical uh, behavior and, and character and, 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 and they'll assign greater and greater responsibility to you. To you. And if, if a midshipman's desires is to uh, succeed in life and, and success to them means uh, increased rank and, and increased uh, recognition. Well, that, that's certainly the way to go. It, it, you know, you're not gonna climb to the top of, of, of industry or the military if, uh, if it's discovered that, that, that you, you do some sneaky st stuff on the side. assumption that when they read your story or the stories of other people who have experienced extraordinary experiences and risen to the occasion to face them with honor, um, that in those extraordinary circumstances, they would just rise to the occasion. They would be honorable too. But the truth is, your honor was tested every day and you had to redefine what it meant to return the next day. And you were known as a fighter. You were known as a resistor. You fought a battle behind bars on a daily basis. And, and I know that that was an incredibly lonely battle on many, many nights and days. Um, is there something you can speak to midshipmen to speak to what it is, honor not just as, a, as an idea, as a concept, but as a daily practice, that what, what that, the exercise of that muscle on a daily basis means Well, I, I think uh, for a midshipman to be uh, uh, aspiring to uh, a good career, no matter whether it's in the military or civilian life, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you, you need to practice honor. Uh, and uh, certainly if, if you're detected as uh, someone who sometimes uh, prevaricates or, or cheats or, uh, or whatever, uh, you're not going to be a good leader. You know, that, that, that word gets around pretty fast. You know, very bad news gets around even faster than good news. And, and th then if you uh, make demands on, uh, on your role, uh, in your role as a, as a leader, and people know that uh, they're not being uh, dealt with fairly or honestly, 
they're not going to give you a full me measure of, uh, uh, of devotion there. So you do need to, to practice uh, it. And, and uh, sometimes there, there are consequences. You know, my consequence was getting tortured. Uh, you know, hopefully a midshipman won't, won't face that severe punishment, but, but, but they will uh, uh, by failure to, you know, achieve their, their career goals. Um, we're about a third of the way in. Would it be nice to take a little bit of a break and drink water? Just After I tell you the story, which you'll probably pull out, rule out. No, but uh, uh, the, I, I mentioned the Vietnamese would not let us learn Vietnamese. And the only Vietnamese I know is Mot Hai Ba Bo, which is one, two, three, four. But that's the limit of it. But uh, the Vietnamese assigned uh, names to us. They didn't call me Shoemaker. Uh, uh, my name was, and this is somewhat embarrassing, I think, was H-U-N-G. Hung, they pronounced it, but it, it might have a double meaning. And uh, so I was kind of worried about that until I went to a Vietnamese barber recently and asked him to translate what Hung means. And, and I was just really pleased because he told me it means brave. So it was kind of a neat, uh, after, the, after the fact, translation. You may not want to use that. Though. No, 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 I do want to use that. That is exactly the kind of thing. It's, it's, it's interesting. We went to a Vietnamese restaurant last night. Hmm. And, you know, I've been reading your stories for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, you know, uh, one could say that what you received was in. Actually, would you like to take a little break? Sure, let's I do think, it. Uh, Alex, could you help uh, Bob with this? We're going to cut here.